<laughs> Somebody has a drum machine here. I heard it. <laughs> I've never been in a church like this that had singing like that. It's wonderful singing. Uh, it sounds like a whole band. And uh, it's a new experience for me. And I don't have very many new experiences in church since I was raised in the church. I've been a Christian since I was a child and been in more different kinds of churches than I can recall. But I've never been in a church that had this kind of music. And it's wonderful. It's, it's my wife knows how often I complain about the worship in churches we visit. <laughs> but she won't hear any complaints about this. I, I like this. I'd like to do that every Sunday. Well, let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this wonderful community of believers that we've been able to spend the weekend with and for your word that you give us. Uh, we have so much more access to it than many people do. And, of course, much more responsibility because we have such ready access. I pray that you'll help us to rise to the responsibilities and the, and the privilege that we have to study your word, to come to understand more what your mind is, what your plan is, as Richard was talking about your plan. And we pray that we'll understand your plan and your goals and your values and exactly what your purpose is for us. Help that to be made known to us, not so much by what I say, but by your spirit illuminating us. I pray that what I say will have, will, will facilitate that, Father, and I pray that you will speak to us beyond what anything uh, I say can do, because it's only when we hear from you that we change, and we pray that that will happen for your glory, for, for our enjoyment as well, because we enjoy glorifying you, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, 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 for the most part, will speak anywhere I'm invited, but I have been invited to go to hell at times, and I don't intend to accept <laughs> the invitation. So there are some limits. Although our, some people think Jesus went and accepted a preaching invitation there. But uh, I, he's been there, and I don't need to go there, I trust him. But I do, I, it's a challenge for me because it's now, yeah, this is pretty good. I, I've got 45 minutes, I think, or less. But I was asked by Alan to speak specifically on the subject of fruit bearing. Uh, he gave the title, Why is fruit, Bearing Fruit Such a Big Deal or something yeah. like that. And uh, he was interested in me speaking on that because something, well, when he came to our school in Seattle, we covered uh, some of the major prophets. We covered Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, Daniel while he was there. And in Isaiah, we hit across many times this reference to fruit, God's obsession with fruit, which isn't only in Isaiah. It's a very strong theme in Isaiah, but it's found throughout the Bible. It starts really with Genesis chapter 1, where God said, everybody be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So God's talking about fruit the first time he opens his mouth speaking to Adam and Eve. And throughout the New Testament, fruit is the issue also. This is very clear. We talked on the weekend about discipleship, and one of the verses we passed over, you know, in, in the course of talking about the subject, was Jesus' statement in John 15, 8, where he said, In this my Father is glorified that you bring forth much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. So discipleship and fruit bearing are obviously connected inseparably. You will bear much fruit, and thus you will be my disciples. But the most important part of that verse is the earlier clause. In this my Father is glorified. The real reason that bearing fruit is a big deal is because in that way God is glorified. And there's only one thing that really should matter to somebody who's really truly turned around from being a heathen to being a Christian. And that is that the heathen doesn't care at all about God being glorified. Almost everything else takes priority over that. When a person becomes a Christian, that takes priority over everything. Paul said, well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 31. And Jesus said, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. This is what being a Christian is for. It's not for you, it's for God. Now, you benefit from it because God is just that kind of a God. He's worked out a system that 
when he's glorified, those who glorify him have every reason to rejoice that they did so. They benefited in immense ways. And it's not just a reward for doing it, it's simply by coming into proper relationship with reality. God is the glorious one. If we fail to glorify him, we simply have not opened our eyes yet. We're walking around blind. That's not good for anybody. To see clearly is to see the glory of God manifest. In fact, the Bible says that the whole earth is to become full of the knowledge of the glory of God. The Bible says that different ways, three times. It's in the book of Numbers, it's in the book of Habakkuk, it's in the book of Isaiah. One passage says, uh, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Another verse says the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And, and another verse combines those two. It says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Paul takes that language and applies it to our own experience when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, he, God, who caused the light to shine out of darkness, he means in Genesis 1. God, who caused the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, and we've already gotten that. He's, he's shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. What Jesus is about is the glory of God. What we are about is the glory of God. And Jesus said, in this, my Father is glorified, that you bring forth much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So I want to talk about fruit. And it's, it's a very big challenge for me because there's so much in the Bible about fruit. And Alan just wanted me to talk about the importance of bearing fruit. And I think, well, it's a huge subject. And I'm going to have to, obviously, uh, abbreviate now, you might say, well, you've got 40 minutes, you know, why do you have to abbreviate? You haven't heard me before. <laughs> I don't, I'm not good at grief. Shakespeare said, brevity is the soul of wit. And if that is so, I'm a very witless character. <laughs> because I don't have much of that quality of brevity. But I will fit in within the time limits. Just, just hope I can say something in that period of time worth having said. Would you look at Matthew chapter 21, please? Matthew 21, an important parable of Jesus. Like there are some that aren't. <laughs> and I think I'll start at verse 33. Matthew 21, 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, stoned another. And again he sent other servants more than the first, and he did likewise to them. Then last of all he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, Jesus says, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Now his audience, this is like an audience response kind of a parable. His, his audience said they, uh, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits in their season. And ju jump down just to verse 43. Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. The fruits of what? The fruits of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a concept that began in the Old Testament. It was associated very closely with Israel. When God brought them out of Egypt to Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 and 6, at Mount Sinai, God said to Israel, If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, 
And you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the nations, for all the earth is mine, says the Lord. And you will be a kingdom unto me of priests. Israel would be a kingdom to God, a kingdom of God, a kingdom of priests to God. That's the first time the Bible ever mentions God having a kingdom. It's the first time he ever established a kingdom. It was a conditional kingdom. It was made up of people. And the conditions were, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. You can see that yourself if you look at Exodus 19, 5 and 6. The trouble is, of course, if you know anything about Israel's history, they didn't. <clears throat> they didn't keep his covenant. They didn't obey his voice. But God was merciful and he gave them time and time again chances to get it right. And they did not. And now in Matthew 21, verse 43, Jesus says, okay, the kingdom of God is being taken from you and going to be given to another nation who will bring forth the fruits of it. The problem is you didn't bring forth the fruits that the kingdom was supposed to bring forth. Here the imagery is of a vineyard. A vineyard is supposed to produce grapes, fruit. And if somebody invests in a vineyard, they hope to make a profit. They hope to, to yield some good fruit from it. In this case, the vineyard did not produce fruit. And the problem here was the vine dressers, or what translation you have might say the stewards or something like that, the, the vine keepers. You see, this is uh, the setting of this parable, like all the parables, was a familiar kind of a uh, scenario for the people that Jesus spoke to. Uh, in those days, there weren't many landowners compared to peasants. Most people were peasants, and there were some landowners. There was no middle class, just the rich and the poor. The rich people owned land, the people who didn't own land could work land. And they could come into a profitable relationship with the landowner if they leased his property on the agreement that when harvest or vintage would come, they would produce as their rent some of what was produced from the land. They would keep the rest so the, the poor could work somebody else's land and make a profit. As, but of course the arrangement was they're renting. They, when the vintage comes, they give the fruit to the owner, some of them. A portion of it is the rent. And so that's the scenario that Jesus envisages. A man you know, put tenants on his land, vine dressers, to keep the land. And when the vintage came, it was time for them to produce the fruit. So he sent his servants, and they abused the servants. He sent more servants, and they abused them just the same. It's kind of a strange thing to happen. I'm sure by this time his listeners are really surprised, because I doubt if this really literally ever happened, that, that you know, tenants of the land would refuse to pay the rent and even abuse and kill the messengers that were sent by the owner to collect his portion. But they did that. It's a shocking behavior. But more shocking still, they said, I'll send my son. Certainly they'll respect him. Well, that was a miscalculation. They didn't respect him. Instead, they said, this is the heir. Let's kill him and we can keep the inheritance. So their thinking is, when the old man dies, this guy gets the vineyard. But if he's dead, possessions nine tenths of the law, we're already here. If we kill the son, there's no heir. We get to keep his inheritance. It'll be ours. Now, they're not thinking in legal terms. They're just thinking in selfish terms. And so they kill the son. Now, what does that represent? That's, that's kind of transparent, isn't it? I mean, some of the parables of Jesus are a little hard to see through, but not that one. You see, Israel was supposed to produce fruit for God. God sent the prophets to them. That's the servants who came saying, produce the fruit. They killed the prophets. They abused the prophets. He sent more. They did the same. <laughs> Finally, he sent his son, Jesus, and they killed him too. Now, this was the last straw. In fact, in the parable, Jesus emphatically says, last of all, he sent his son. There was a whole stream of servants before that. Prophet after prophet, century after century, Israel had 1,400 years of opportunity to be and produce the fruits of the kingdom of God. They killed the prophets. They got one last chance when Jesus came. Last of all, he sent his son. They killed him too. No more chances for them. He says the kingdom of God's gonna be taken from you and given to someone else now. You've had 1,400 years to get it right. You haven't done it. Your history, I'm giving the kingdom to someone else and they will produce the fruits. Now, what nation did he give it to, to produce the fruits? Not a political nation, certainly, as Israel was, but a spiritual nation. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, says, 
We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. <laughs> we're the ones, the Gentiles and, of course, the remnant of Israel who believed in Christ. The church is that spiritual nation. The kingdom was taken from one nation and given to another nation. Jesus said, I didn't make that up. Some people are offended by that. They call that replacement theology. I didn't make it up. <laughs> Jesus said it. And so the vineyard is taken from the abusive vine dressers and given to someone else who, it is said, will bring forth the fruit. Now, this is very important because sometimes people say, well, we, you know, we're special, we're elite, we're the people that God favored, Israel blew it, we're the good guys, we're better than they are, not necessarily. An awful lot of Christians I know haven't borne much fruit either. In fact, the church has not had 1,400 years, but 2,000 years so far. I don't think we're necessarily superior people to them. The, the most important thing we should focus on when we say God took it from them and gave it to us is not so much the privilege, as, although that is a privilege, but the responsibility. The reason he dumped them is they didn't produce the fruit. Now it's our responsibility to produce the fruit. That's what God's looking for. Now this parable of Jesus came from a parable of, of the Old Testament in Isaiah, actually. In Isaiah chapter 5, Jesus was very clearly alluding to it. I mean, clearly enough that none of his listeners could easily have missed it. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, Isaiah says, now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved, he means God, regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. He expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Now here we have a parable that begins with almost exactly the same words as Jesus' parable. He's got, he plants a vineyard, he builds a wine press, he builds a hedge, he, uh, you know, he does the things to guarantee a good vintage, to guarantee success. Later in this passage, God says, what more could I have done to get good grapes from these people? But I didn't get good grapes from them. The point is that God did everything that should have been necessary to get fruit. That's what a person wants from a vineyard, fruit. He says, I looked for it to produce good grapes. It didn't produce bad grapes, unusable grapes, like wild, sour grapes that can't be used for wine. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a total loss. All that investment, all that effort, that's a loss to God because the vineyard did not produce. Now, he explains this parable, its meaning, in verse 7, Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plan. He looks for justice, but behold, oppression. He looks for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now, what fruit was he looking for? Justice and righteousness. He was looking for good grapes. What are the good grapes? Justice and righteousness. He looked for justice. He looked for righteousness. What did he get? Bad grapes. Oppression. Abuse, exploitation. In other words, God had sought to create a holy nation that would produce in their society a just and righteous society. He gave them his laws for that, told them how to do it. He took them out of Egypt and put them in the land all their own, removed the stones, removed the Canaanites, removed everything that would be an obstacle. He gave them every advantage. If anyone could produce justice and righteousness, they would not need any more advantages than were given to Israel. God said, what more could I have done to guarantee a good vintage here? But I, I've done it all. I haven't gotten it. Now see, this is the Old Testament imagery. In Isaiah, there's many references to the fruit that God is looking for. It is justice. It is righteousness. And what is justice and righteousness? This is, this is really a, a godly way of living and dealing with people. God wanted Israel to live 
as a society that honored him in not just their religion, but in their social life too. In their business dealings, in their uh, marriages, in, in every aspect of their life, he wanted them to deal justly and righteously. He's looking for change. He's looking for a community that isn't like the rest of the world. A holy nation, a peculiar people, a kingdom of his own that follows his ways and therefore a kingdom of justice. Now Israel, they weren't the right stuff. They didn't produce it really much ever. There were a few generations, like Josiah's generation and Hezekiah's generation, a few. Uh, maybe some of the time under the judges, when the judges were still alive and keeping an eye on things, there were there were some just some you know righteous generations, but in general, it was like Jesus described. When when God came looking for the fruit, it wasn't presented. Now Isaiah doesn't mention the vine dressers; he just mentioned he didn't get good fruit. Jesus puts a slightly different spin on the parable. He adds the leaders of Israel. The ones that were charged with discipling the nation, the priests, the spiritual leaders, they're like the vine dressers. They're supposed to be cultivating justice and righteousness in the nation, and they failed. Well, they didn't just fail. They just didn't do it. It's not like they tried and failed. They just didn't try. The leaders just fed themselves. The leaders took advantage of the people. And therefore, they were like wicked tenants of a vineyard. They're supposed to be producing fruit for the owner, and they're not doing it. Now, of course, Jesus talks about the servants that were sent to collect the, the vintage at the right time. These are the prophets in the Old Testament who came one after another. What, what was the prophet's message? God is looking for justice. God is looking for righteousness. Where's the fruit? This is his vineyard. Why aren't you producing fruit? They came to collect the rent on the vineyard, and, and they got killed, many of them ignored and abused. And finally, Jesus came with the same message. He was their last chance. Last of all, he sent his son. They abused him too, and Jesus said, okay, it's over for you. I'm taking the privilege and the responsibility from you. I'm going to give it to somebody else. Now, who is that somebody else? Well, it's us. Now, what this puts the words of Jesus about very much fruit in an interesting context, because I mentioned John 15, 8, where he said, in this my Father is glorified that you bring forth much fruit, so you should be my disciples. That's in the context. The immediate previous verses are about Jesus saying, I am the vine. No, not I'm the vine. I am the true vine. My Father is the true husbandman now. He's cultivating this vine now. He's going to produce the fruit through this vine. And you are the branches, Jesus said. He said, everyone who abides in me is like a branch that remains in me and produces, or actually bears fruit. The difference between producing and bearing. The vine produces the fruit. The branches bear it. They carry it. They hold it. But the point is, he's the true vine. Now the vine, when he says, I'm the true vine, he means in contrast to that other vine. I'm the true one. What's the other one? In the Old Testament? Well, Isaiah 5 said, The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant, the vine. Israel was the vine. Israel was to bring forth the fruit. Israel failed. Now there's a new Israel. His name is Jesus. Israel in the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of Christ himself. And Jesus said, I'm now the vine. The fruit's coming from me now. But you are going to bear it. You see, it's the body of Christ that is to bear the fruit now. The disciples, so shall you be my disciple, he said, if you bear much fruit. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate purpose of God is <coughs> he's still after the fruit. He always has been, always will be. Of course, physical fruit is one of the great blessings that God gave mankind. And Adam and Eve were given the task to cultivate the garden and to be fruitful and so forth. But this was to be an image of something spiritual, obviously. Not only are we to cultivate the earth in the physical sense, but everything that God made to be cultivated serves as a spiritual illustration. That's why Jesus was able to make so many parables about the kingdom of God from agriculture. 
A sower went out to sow. What was the end of that? Well, the seed that fell on good ground produced what? Fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. She said that's the word of the kingdom. The preaching of the kingdom of God is the seed being sown. It falls on different kinds of hearts. Some produce fruit, some don't. But the ones that do, that's what he's sowing the seed for, is so that those who will can produce fruit. Now, if Jesus is the one producing the fruit, one might say, well, why preach to us about it? He knows what he's doing. Yeah, but we need to know what he's doing. Because he said that the true Israel, the true people of God, will bring forth fruit. And this is not a prediction necessarily that everyone in this room is necessarily going to produce fruit. But it defines those who are the true Israel as the ones who do. He says, I'm giving this project to another nation who will produce the fruit. So if you are producing the fruit, you're them. If you're not producing the fruit, well, sounds like you're not them. Fruitfulness is the sign of being a disciple. So shall you be my disciples if you bear much fruit. Being fruitful means what? Well, that's something we need to consider. Justice, righteousness, this is the fruit that God is looking for in Israel. He's still looking for it. You know, the, Bible, the New Testament talks about the fruit of righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 11, it's talking about God's disciplining of his children. He says, now no discipline for the present seems joyous but grievous. But afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised by it. So God's still, in the book of Hebrews, still looking for the fruit of righteousness. And so he'll discipline us, or as Jesus said, he prunes the branches. If they're not bearing fruit, he prunes them. He disciplines us so that we will bring forth what? The same thing he was looking for in the Old Testament, the fruit of righteousness. James says the same thing. In James 3.18 he says, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by them who make peace. The peacemakers. Remember, they're the ones Jesus said they'll be called the sons of God. They're the ones who sow the seeds of this fruit of righteousness, James 3.18. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Peacemakers are sowing the seed that produces the fruit of righteousness. In other words, whether you're looking at the Old Testament or the New, whether you're looking at Genesis chapter 1 or just about anywhere in the New Testament, God's still talking about his one obsession. He loves fruit. And the fruit he's looking for is righteousness. And he wants it to be produced in us and through us. Now, I, by through us, I mean he's not just wanting us to have an internal experience of being righteous. He wants us to be agents of righteousness. Sowing the fruit of righteousness by being peacemakers, by being like Jesus in other words. Our following Jesus, our being like Jesus, our spreading the seed, the word of the kingdom, this is supposed to be spreading the fruit of the kingdom. And the true church, the true Christians do. He has given the kingdom and the fruit bearing of the kingdom task to those, to another nation who will bring forth the fruits of it. Now, some of you are fruit bearing. Maybe some of you aren't. I don't know all of you. It seems like a good group to me, but I don't know everybody. Maybe some of you don't bear fruit of right. Maybe your life isn't righteous. Maybe you're not just in your dealings. Maybe you do cheat sometimes. I don't know. But you're not, not if you're a follower of Christ. Or, <clears throat> Christ forbids that. God forbids that. A follower of Christ is someone who, as Jesus said, who continues in his words. If you continue in my words, you're my disciples indeed. He said in John 8, 31, so if you are a Christian, you are bearing fruit. Now, I'm not saying you always, every moment, are doing the right thing, because no one is always good. I shouldn't say that. I should say no one always does good. You can be a good person even when you stumble and do the wrong thing. If you are a good person and you stumble, you get back up and you repent, you, don't, you say, I don't want to do that anymore. And the reason you have that reaction in your stomach is because you are a good person. If you weren't a good person, you wouldn't care that you stopped. In fact, it would be kind of a way of life. But the truth is that 
If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it is not your habit to be unrighteous or to be unjust because the followers of Jesus Christ are transformed people or are being transformed into his likeness. And that means that as we do, his fruit is produced through us. Now, one reason I think we need to preach to ourselves about fruit bearing, even though it's God or Jesus, the vine, who produces the fruit, and we're just the branches, and we just abide in him, what does it look like to abide in him? This, is a, this really is a project that we cooperate with God about. That's why you'll find people who really are Christians but have really little fruit. Maybe that's why some bear 30-fold and some 60 and some 100. Because of the degree of participation with God. The, uh, the degree of cooperation or lack thereof. You know, Paul was talking about the, the Corinthian church as God's field. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, you, the church, are God's field. And he says, Apollos and I have worked in this field. He said, I planted and Apollos water. But God gave the increase. Now, God's the one who makes the thing grow, but not until somebody has planted water. I'm Apollos, I'm Paul, I'm planting, I'm watering, but I can't make the seed grow. That's not a, humans can't do that. That's like a, a miracle of some kind. Still a miracle. We get used to it because it happens all the time around us. But it's still, if you really think about it, it's still kind of a miracle. It certainly is something that no human being can possibly do. And so the most we can do is plant and water. We can cooperate, we can cultivate, but it's up to God to really bring the fruit. Christ is the fruit producer. We have to abide in him, and abiding in him means that we are planting and cultivating <coughs> fruit. We are sowing the seeds in our own lives and in the world in general. You see, God's not just looking for us to be just by ourselves. He wants us to be the agents through which the world is in some ways coming into a greater uh, appreciation of the ways of God and of justice. In fact, everywhere the gospel has gone and been really embraced, the society has become somewhat more just than before. We're not really in touch with that much because we've been only raised in Christendom. We've been raised in a society that, based, unless, unless you were raised in some other part of the world, but if you were raised in the West, you are raised in a world that maybe we've known Christianity has had its impact for about hundreds, a couple thousand years, I think. And therefore, even those people who are not Christians, more than they know, are pensioners on the kingdom of God. Because before Paul came to Europe, before the gospel came to England, before the, before the missionaries went around the world, you know what the whole world was pretty much doing before Jesus was taken to them? Well, they're always, they were all worshiping demons. We've probably got some people in our society who now worship demons too. That's because we're reverting. But the truth is that Christianity, or the influence of Christianity, has mostly wiped out demon worship throughout the West for most of history. And they were worshiping demons often by sacrificing their own children on altars to demons. We can hardly imagine anyone we know doing that. But I realize that when someone gets an abortion, in many respects, they're doing the same thing. But they don't know they're doing that. If they knew they were doing that, they probably wouldn't. Because most people have more of a conscience toward God, even if they're not a Christian, than that. Society's level of, of civility, the whole concept of justice has increased just, uh, you know, the rising tide raises all the ships, you know. I mean, as Christianity's influence in the church is prominent in a society, even those who don't become Christians become more convicted, become more aware of what righteousness is. And you know, this is, this is filling the world with fruit. If you look at Isaiah chapter 27, Isaiah 27, 6, this is a, pr a pr prophecy about us, really. It's about the Gentiles coming to God in the new covenant. I won't take the time to give you the whole context because I'm, I'm limited here tonight, today, whatever this is. I, I lose track of time. I'm indoors all the time in public. But this is talking about essentially us. And it says, those who come, that's us, we have come to God through Christ. He shall cause to take root 
in Jacob, that is in the true Israel, and says, or in Christ, who is the new Israel, himself, the true vine. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Now we sometimes think that it's enough that I just become a, a fruitful Christian in the sense that I become better. You know, I, I become more Christ-like. And maybe win a few souls. Actually, the church I was raised in thought fruit-bearing was soul-winning. Maybe you think that way. I don't know. I, I, I was raised in a church, you know, to bear much fruit meant to go and win souls, a lot of people to Christ. Uh, it was like a synonym for that. Well, I, I don't think that anywhere in the Bible bearing fruit is a synonym for winning souls. So I think winning souls is a good thing. But bearing fruit has more to do with the life of Christ and the quality of Christ's character being reproduced in you and through you to the world at large with which you have, uh, upon which you have an influence, which will include, of course, winning souls. But the point is, look what it says. God's people will fill the earth with the fruit. And if you look over at Isaiah 32, since you're already in Isaiah, this is one of the many, many times Isaiah talks about this theme. It's his, one of his favorite themes. This is fruit thing. And here he talks about what the effect will be of the Spirit of God being poured out at Pentecost and since, which is, of course, the time we're living in since then. And it says in... Uh, Isaiah 32, verse 15, it says, Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, that is anticipating Pentecost, which when the Spirit was poured out upon them. He says, Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from high, and the result is the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. Then justice, yeah, that's the fruit God's looking for, justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness, those are the two fruits he was looking for in his vineyard. Justice and righteousness, that's the fruit. Justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. That is to say, the spiritual fruit of justice and righteousness are going to be produced by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul refers to it as the fruit of the Spirit. When God poured out his Holy Spirit on the church, or when he pours out his Holy Spirit on you, the effect is the fruit of the Spirit. What is that? Well, Paul calls it love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, self-control. He gives a list of nine things. He's just unpacking what righteousness is. It's still the fruit of righteousness. He's just unpacking its details. Being a righteous person, a loving person, a peaceable person, a, a, a merciful person, a good person, a self-controlled person, a patient person. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And these are the true evidences that you are a spiritual person. Sometimes spirituality is measured in some Christian communities by different standards in there. Sometimes the person who says amen the most, the person who can quote the most verses, the person who can sing best or most exuberantly is uh, earning a reputation or maybe seeking to earn a reputation. As a spiritual person in the congregation, these things are considered to be marks of true zeal, true spirituality. In some congregations, giftedness is. You know, there's some Christians who think that if you speak in tongues, that's like a, a marker of spirituality, or prophecy even better. Remember, those are not the things that mark Christianity or even spirituality. Jesus said, many will say in that day, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I did many mighty works in your name, and I will say, I never knew you. Why? All those spiritual gifts. Well, giftedness is not what determines spirituality. Fruit is. Yeah. I think I mentioned in one of my earlier lectures a man named Juan Carlos Ortiz, a, a, an Argentine pastor. He made some interesting illustrations that I like to repeat because they're good. <laughs> this is a good one. He lived in Buenos Aires, and he, he said, you know, at Christmas time, we like to have trees in the house like you Americans do. But in Buenos Aires, there's not many trees. So he says, most of our Christmas trees are artificial. He said they're very cheap things made of wire and cellophane and so forth. They're really cheap construction. But he says you can buy one for two or three dollars. But he said on Christmas Eve, people hang all kinds of gifts on them. The gifts are, of course, collected off the trees on Christmas. But 
He says, the night before Christmas, the, the tree might have an Omega watch hanging on it, a diamond ring, you know, very valuable gifts hanging on the tree. But don't make any mistake, the tree is of no value whatsoever. December 26th, they're all out on the curb waiting for the garbage collector to collect the trees. The night before, they may have had Omega watches on, he says, but they're worthless. The tree is worthless because the tree didn't produce the Omega watches. The gifts hanging on the tree don't tell you anything about the value of the tree because somebody else, not the tree, put the gifts there. But he said if a tree produces fruit, if you have an orange tree out in your yard and it produces good oranges, that tells you you've got a healthy, good orange tree. It tells you about the quality of the tree itself. Because Jesus said a good tree produces good fruit. And an evil tree produces evil fruit. And Jesus said you will know them by their fruits, not by their gifts. True spirituality is measured in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, of course, some people say, well, I'll take the fruit of the Spirit then and forget the gifts. I don't think you have to make I don't get to it. It's not either or. I mean, <laughs> gifts and fruit are available to the church both, but but one and not the other is a true mark of your own spiritual quality of your life. And that is if you are like Jesus. Do you love like Jesus? Are you patient like Jesus? Are you kind like Jesus? Are you good like Jesus? Those are the fruits of the Spirit. Are you righteous? Like Jesus and your dealings. Do people, is that what people think when they've been in touch with you? When they've had business dealings with you? When they've played sports with you? When they've done anything with you and they go away and they say, now that was, I was in the presence of a person who is really a, a righteous person. That person's a really good person. I think that person's maybe the kind of person I should be. Then you, you begin to sow the seeds. That person's a peacemaking person. That's a loving person. And so you begin to be an influence. You bear that fruit within you because God produces it in you. Because you cultivate it. You cooperate. And then it becomes something that spreads to others. And uh, the, the wilderness, as it were, the unfruitful world, becomes filled with righteousness and justice. That's actually predicted as an outcome of the new covenant. And so is this in Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, are quoted in Matthew 12 as being fulfilled in Jesus. So this is a prophecy about Jesus. We know that. And he says in Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, this is Jesus, whom I uphold, my elect one. Israel was the elect nation. Jesus is the elect one. He's the new elect. The new chosen. He's my elect one whom my soul delights in. I have put my spirit upon him. Okay, expect fruit then. He will bring forth justice. Well, that's the fruit. I put my spirit on him and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He didn't just live a just life himself. Yeah, he was a fruitful one in that respect. There was fruit in his own life, but he extended that justice to the Gentiles. Hey, a lot of us are here, Gentiles who are now recipients and beneficiaries of this influence of Jesus. He brings forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flax he will not quench. In other words, he won't be like most street preachers. He's not obnoxious. He's not armored. He's gentle. He's a peacemaker. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. He's a gentle, peaceable <gasps> sower, sowing the seed. It says, he will bring forth justice for truth. He will not be discouraged. He will not fail. Now you see, God planted a vine in Israel looking for fruit, and they failed. And God was discouraged. He said, what more could I do? This is a real disappointment. But no, Jesus will not fail, and he will not, be, he will not be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. And even the coastlands will wait for his law, the influence of his word, the influence of his rule, the kingdom. So basically, Isaiah's prophecy is that God didn't get the fruit he wanted from Israel. So he's, as Jesus put it, the kingdom's taken from them, given to somebody else, us. 
Now the burden is on us. And, but it's, it's not such a great burden because we don't have to produce the fruit. We just have to bear it. We are laborers together with God, Paul said. And that was in the context of I planted and Paulus watered and God gave the increase. He said, we're laborers together with God. Let me show you uh, something in the New Testament on this. I have quite a lot more to say, but I won't say it on. I'm going to have to wind this down right away. But in Mark chapter 4, another parable about fruit. Mark 4, verse 26. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Sounds like the parable of the sower, but it's a different parable. Just another variation on the theme. He should scatter the seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. This is saying the same thing Paul said. It's God who gives the increase. We can sow the seed, we can water the seed, but we can go to sleep and the seed still grows. We're not making it grow. We don't make seed grow. We don't produce fruit. We have to sow the seed. We have to do what a farmer does. But after a farmer has done everything a farmer can do, he can't do anything else. The seed's not going to grow unless God gives the increase. So this is the kingdom is spread this way by us sowing these seeds, and it grows. And then he says this, for the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, like a blade of grass. He's talking in this case about wheat, not, not grapes this time. Different kind of fruitfulness, wheat crop. Produces first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain, or the mature grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The harvest in another parable, the one of the wheat and the tares, is the end of the world when he sends his angels to gather it and so forth. The harvest is the end. When shall the harvest come? A lot of people are looking for Jesus to come today. Well, I'd, I'd be as happy as could be if Jesus came today. But from what he said, I don't think it's that likely to tell you the truth. I hate to say it, but he said, when the grain has ripened, when the fruit is mature, then he will put in the sickle. It would be a strange thing for God to wait for 2,000 years for fruit. And when the fruit hasn't really appeared, you'll say, ah, I'm done waiting. Put in the sickle. Let's take it as it is. Uh, he's, he's more patient than that. And he doesn't, he's not going to come until the fruit has come. He's that committed to it. He's committed to wait 2,000 years or 5,000 years or 10,000 years. He'll wait as long as it takes. This one last scripture, I think that I said that one was the last. I was mistaken. This was the last. <laughs> Sometimes I mistake the last one for the next to the last, or even further back in that. <laughs> but in James 5, 7, this will be the last, I hope. Therefore be patient, brethren, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and the later rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. God is waiting for the fruit of the earth. Be patient until he comes. But he, why hasn't he come yet? Because he's waiting patiently. You need to be patient too. But he's patiently waiting for what? Until the fruit ripens. He patiently waits for the fruit. God created mankind and the first command he gave them was bear fruit. Be fruitful. He raised up Israel to be as it were a fruit producing nation. They did not. He has assigned that to the church, and the church has taken even longer than Israel had, and has not done as much as we might have wished, although there has been fruit. Certainly many nations have been greatly transformed by the gospel, our own included. And it's being transformed backward by the rejection of the gospel now. But you see, the gospel's influence brings fruit in a society. And that fruit is brought forth through those who are attached to Christ. He is bringing forth the fruit. We are the branches, and we must exhibit fruit in our lives. And he's waiting for that. He's not going to come back until the fruit of the earth is ripe. That's what he said. So we might as well just, instead of always hoping we're getting out of here real quick, why do we, we really need to occupy until he comes and occupy ourselves with bearing fruit and, and bearing fruit to the world? Because he's not going to fail. 
He's not going to be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. That's the fruit he looked for. Israel didn't produce it. We will. Maybe not in our generation. Maybe it'll be a later generation of us. But those of us who are followers of Christ will and must because that's what we own. We are disciples. And you shall be disciples by bringing glory to God through bearing much fruit. And not otherwise. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the way your word challenges us and places before us a clear goal. Maybe some of the things about what it means to be fruitful are not totally clear. What it means to cultivate that fruit. What it means to even uh, bear that fruit. What that looks like in our lives. Father, we can't say everything in one morning. But you have said everything in your word. And we have access to that. I pray, Father, that as we continue to search the scriptures, we will continue to have revelation from your spirit of what it is the next thing you want to produce in our lives. The next step we need to take in cultivating that. And the next person in our world that we're to influence in the direction of Christ and of that fruit that you want to see. People living justly, loving mercy, walking humbly with God. Justice and righteousness, the fruit being you desire. Father, you alone can produce that fruit, but we need to bear it. And I pray that you will give us the understanding and the, and the uh, motivation to do that and to not be any more content than you are to be fruitless. You are definitely not content with a fruitless vineyard. We should not be content either. I pray that you'll help us to share your obsession. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so secure. You're here.
coming out. Let's show them a little bit. You know, as, as informal as we like to keep our worship services, we also have an edge to it. We don't just do this for a show. There's always that appeal to respond to the message of God. And one of the ways that we try to do that, maybe a little different than other churches, is we have a card that we always pass out. Some of you guys are very familiar with it. Maybe some of you aren't so much. That's why I'm taking the time to explain it. We call it a communication card. It's just a way for you to communicate with us if there was something that struck you, something that you would like our prayer team to pray about, or if there's some information you want. If you want to go deeper with this, if you want to talk about it more, if you want to help apply the things that you've heard this week, or you've got other concerns, and you want to know how God would have you to obey Him in those concerns, that's what that, that card is for. So you can fill that out. We're going to have our ushers. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing one more song, and we're going to have a basket passed. Now, a lot of times when we go to churches and they pass a basket, that's where they ask you to pay for the things you just got. <laughs> that's not what we're after. We didn't invite anybody here to get any money from you. We wanted you to be with us as we worship God so we can give something to you. But for our members, well, that's how we keep the lights on. Is we all chip in and we, and we give a little bit. And so we're going to do two things with those baskets as they're passed around. One is give you a chance to put your communication card in there. And for us members to, to share a little bit of it as God has blessed us. But anyhow, we're going to be passing those baskets while we all stand together and sing. And after this song, we're going to cut you loose. And again, thanks, Steve. Oh, we're all the earth, you the rain on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky.